Teddy Hose, thank you so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from San Francisco. You're currently an animator and a filmmaker, but you were part of the Unification Church, weren't you? Also known as the Moonies. So yeah, the Unification Church was started by Sun Min Moon, um, I believe back in the 50s. Uh, he was born in what is now North Korea. And um, he just, you know, spread uh, his, his gospel like around the world to um, just thousands of people. Uh, over in basically ever since and um, he basically claims to be the second coming of Christ um, and he, uh, he there are practices like arranged marriages um, you know no sex before marriage it's it's all very it's basically like a Christian based religion um, with things like premarital sex being like you know considered worse than murder so I was like taught things like this um, and uh, yeah, I also grew up in the in the same town as the Moons. Um, my parents joined in the '60s. They had uh, a sort of arranged marriage. They kind of would. I think they they had a little bit of choice, and that's kind of a, a story of its own. But um, yeah, basically, I was raised in in the church community um, there, which was uh, it was pretty tense because there's there were you know the people who lived in the town who basically were aware that this Moon family was around here. And, um, you know, this is like, uh, I was born in 78. So in the 70s, like there, there was that whole cult, you know, issue uh, going yeah. on. There was like the Charles Manson and you know, Jonestown, everything. So, um, you know, because the, uh, the Unification Church had recruitment methods that were like taking people to a retreat center and um, basically cutting them off from their past lives. Uh, you know, in order to join this group, um, in, they got clumped with other cults and um, they became like a primary example of a cult basically back then. So uh, yeah, so going to school in that town in the 80s as a kid was, uh, it's it, it was kind of socially crippling and like I basically, I don't know, it, it, it was it was rough because like, um, you, you know, you, you can find in you can find in this community that's like we're here for you. We'll keep you safe, and then at the same time, you're being taught don't trust anyone outside of this, and everyone outside of it is looking at you like you're crazy. So, um, it's a lot to work through, and uh, yeah. When most people think of the uh, Unification Church, they immediately see in their mind's eye a stadium full of couples being married, and um, um, these are people that get that are put together that perhaps even the previous day didn't know each other. And what, what is this all about? There, there's, it's a few things, I think. Um, in Asia, the, like usually uh, marriage has more to do with family. Um, you know, in the Hindu faith, for example, uh, there there's arranged marriages as well. Um, some of it is cultural because the religion did, did come from Korea. But mm. um, another element of it is that, uh, I guess Reverend Moon thought that through uh, interracial marriage that, um, you know, that could somehow uh, help racism. Uh, and studies have shown that it doesn't. But <laughs> um, yeah, it, uh, basically, I think that was his idea. So I'm actually half uh, white, half American, half Japanese. And um, yeah, that, that was his uh, whole idea. So yeah, even people who didn't speak those, uh, the same language and didn't know each other were like matched and, you know, married. Um, I know a few people who are around my age who had parents like that. And um, yeah, it, and it's kind of bizarre because uh, I read a book by, uh, I believe her name is Christine Nivellinen. Uh It's called uh, Ritual Sex and Change of Blood Lineage in the Unification Church. And um, <clears throat> the, the church actually, Reverend Moon started uh, as basically, he, he was in like a sex cult or he started his own group. Um, in Korean shamanism back in the early 1900s, um, they just had these extreme groups where uh, people would join by having sex with the leader. And that was considered like cleansing the womb or like, you know, this is how you get inducted into this group. So, uh, and th that uh, that was called Pikarum or Pigarum. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the exact um, pronunciation of that. But um, yeah, so that's what he did in Korea. And then he came to America uh, to spread his gospel and basically i think maybe his um associates were like that is not cool to do in america you will be considered a freak so somehow he went the exact opposite way and kind of joined uh i guess the more conservative party of like you know sexual conservatism so 
um, yeah. So the, I think it, it's it's kind of bizarre how he just went from one way to completely the other to I guess you know just stay in power. You grew up in the Uni Unification Church, but when Reverend Moon died in I think it was two thousand and twelve, the Sanctuary Church was formed by his son Sean. So what was it like growing up in the main church on like a day to day basis? And how is the Sanctuary Church different from the main church? So the main church, uh, yeah, Reverend Moon, uh, Sunday Moon died in 2012. And his wife, uh, who, um, he was survived by his wife, Hak Jahan, who uh, kept the what is now called the Family Federation for World Peace going. Um, the Unification Church changed its name, I think, sometime in the 90s. Uh, maybe they were just doing a rebrand, or it's usually because some kind of dirt went on them, or they're trying to get rid of uh, of something that happened in the past, and yeah, so they have to rebrand. When the rebrands usually happen, yeah. <laughs> right. So they made it sound less like a church and more like a family federation. I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so the, there was a power struggle. And uh, some people I knew were, were predicting this even before it happened. They're like, when Reverend Moon dies, there's just going to be like this power struggle because they're like a billionaire family with like, you know, again, businesses around the world. Um, and lots of know. children. Yeah, didn't they? Because they encourage that, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I believe Reverend Moon had uh, 13 children. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so basically the Family Federation for World Peace kept going. And then um, it, it, it's still, it's not 100% clear to me, but I believe Sun Moon uh, passed down his crown to uh, Sean Moon, whose uh, Korean name is Hyung Jin Moon. That's how I knew him growing up. Um, and uh, so he claimed that he had this crown and uh, he broke away from uh, Hak Jahan, from his mom. Uh, I, I think there was just that power struggle. It's like, hey, like, you know, my dad told me that I'm the king now, and you, now you want to tell me what to do? And so he just, like, broke away with his brother, uh, Justin Moon, or Kuk Jin, and, uh, who basically owns Car Arms, which is a firearm company. And, um, yeah, they... they uh, so he, you know, Sean Moon calls himself King. He talks about in the news, he's like, well, you know, I was passed down the crown. And um, <clears throat> basically uh, what I see is that because they have this gun business too, uh, they basically intertwine the faith and the business. And just like in the Unification Church, uh, you know, they combine business with, um, with religion and then they justify one with the other. And, uh, you know, so he, was basically telling his followers to, you know, buy an AR-15 and, um, you know, with, going right on track with the paranoia of the outside world. Uh, he basically said, "You need, you all, you all need to defend yourselves." And so, um, yeah, he just put it in their hands, and uh, you know, it, and it's gotten to a bizarre degree where he wears like a crown of bullets. Um, he he gets these custom gold plated guns. It's really this like just sick like fantasy, you know, this like fetish of uh, just you know, I don't know. It to me, I just see right through it. I, I I knew him as a kid, and he was like kind of an insecure kid, and he would like bully some of the other kids in the neighborhood, and you know, he was just this wily, you know, just screaming for attention, and which I can understand because his father was you know the king of the world, and. Um, you know, he's not going to pay attention to his kids like other fathers, you know, so, yeah, I'm sure. The guy lately, uh, isn't it? Not just on the news, but uh, on the A&E show, Cults and Extremism, which, uh, Cults and Extreme Beliefs, which you were featured in, of course, and uh, there was quite a lot of footage of uh, Sean with his crown of bullets and the uh, congregation with their AR-15s, you know, which is, uh, no matter how many times you look at that, it's still really bizarre. But um, Teddy, do you think there's a, is there a particular resonance with and participation in the current extreme polit political climate in the U.S., do you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the reason why I reacted to, uh, you know, Sean Moon having this, um, this ceremony with AR-15 rifles uh, was because, it, it, you know, I knew about that ceremony, ceremony they were going to have, you know, because even people who left the church, uh, we all talk online. And um, some of my friends, like their parents are still in the sanctuary church or still in family federation. It's a lot to work out. So we're all like, how are we going to help pay for our parents' retirement? You know, things like that. So, um, 
you know, I, so from being in the loop, like uh, I basically, you know, I knew about this ceremony they were going to have uh, where they would bring guns, you know, unloaded and they have these um, zip ties to make sure that no one would shoot them. But still just this celebration of with guns, uh, you know, and even after the, the Florida shooting at Parkland, um, they didn't change their plans at all. And uh, to me, that wasn't surprising. Look to um, the, the, the book of Revelation and the rod of iron and they say the guns are basically the rod of iron in the book of Revelation. Yeah, they just kind of, Sean just kind of clumped that together. Um, you know, I think he's just, again, like it's business intertwined with religion. Um, they sell guns. So there yeah. you go, right? And they, they moved to a state uh, with looser gun laws because they tried this in New York and New York had more strict gun laws. So, you know, that's why they chose Pennsylvania. They're talking to the locals. It's kind of gun country. Um, when I was there, it just, it feels like a very rural environment where, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they're they're making friends with a lot of local government and you know people with money in in the neighborhood and um just building a reputation with their store tommy gun so so yeah actually sean moon because he grew up in america so whereas his dad grew up in north korea so i think his dad uh you know he he came to america and it, he was a little more bizarre especially getting older he just would go to his washington uh, Washington Times paper, you know, he owned it. So he would go to these conventions or uh, like these ceremonies for it. And he would talk about like, you know, you know uh, saving sex until marriage. It's, <laughs> you know, just like really still out there. Whereas Sean Moon grew up here. He's a little, you know, he's familiar with what works in America and everything. Um, and, it, you know, he, so he, yeah, I, I looked through his site and like um, he basically, is networking with you know far right basically you know pro gun um kind of extremists uh people you know when i went to the protest for the a and e show um there were people with like nra hats these like old men um so he so there is this you know culture of uh just extremism just kind of in resonance with the modern political time or mon modern political climate and um yeah, and now he's just like networking with them, and he's like very out in the open. He's, he, I think, uh, he think, you know, they they have this sense of like no press is bad press. So, you know, um, they connect on things like homophobia, um, and just anything that's considered liberal or left. Uh, and then he believes that you know the 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 lefties are going to attack us, so we have to be ready and. You know, um, it, you get that so often, don't you, with these cults? They gather guns together, and it's clear that they just love the guns. And they say, well, yeah. we're going to be attacked. And you look out into the horizon, and they do normally live in a compound in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'm right. just thinking of several, not just Waco. And nobody comes to attack them unless they, unless they in some way um, encourage it, like by hoarding guns, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's quite ironic, really, isn't it? It is, but um, it also just, you know, I think what's really unearthing right now um, in the political climate, in my experience, the Unification Church, everything, is just, uh, to me, the fundamental issue that's coming up is that, you know, there are these extremists who believe that the world is not to be trusted as it is. Like, the entire planet is, um, what we learned in the Unification Church was the fall of man, right? Like, Adam and Eve sinned, and then humanity was birthed out of that original sin. So, you know, for me, being born into the Unification Church, according to Reverend Moon, he said, or Sun Man Moon, he said that, uh, you know, we were born without sin. So, like, they were saving the planet. So, it, basically, you get groups, you know, this, to me, it's all the same thing. It's like, you get all these uh, extremist groups who believe that the world as it is, it, it's automatically wrong. And so, they have to defend, you know, their group, their small group, who's misunderstood. And anything you say, no matter how logical, is an attack. And like, it's stopping them from rehabilitating the world. So, uh, you know, it's really a matter of just, step, like, uh, <clears throat> when I try to talk to people like that, I just, uh, I try, I know what it's like to be in that ether and to like hear things as that. So I really try to be conversational and, you know, in this, in the show, like a lot of people were telling me, wow, you were like really calm and talking to that one guy from Sanctuary Church when you're at the protest. Like I would have screamed at him and stuff. And I'm like, that's exactly what he wants. He wants me to look like the freak who's like, you guys, screw you guys. And, you know, to them, it's like, it's almost like sports. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
I don't know. I just get angry and they'll say, look how angry these people who are against us are. Yeah, exactly. It's well, you know, science calls it con uh, confirmation bias, where basically mm. you just take the the tiniest scrap of evidence and you're like, see, I'm right. You know, um, I don't know how to describe that in a more kind of scientific way, but yeah. I think that's it exactly. So you did eventually leave the church, but there must have been psychological effects after leaving. I think you said that you now go to group therapy for ex cult members. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Um, and I, and I want to clarify something. Uh, one thing about leaving a cult is that, you know, I think if you're fresh out of leaving a cult, you think that everything else is a cult too. And it's like, it's either this or this, or like one group has the answer. I just haven't picked the right one yet. But, um, no, you know, I, I read a book uh, by Yanya, Yanya Lalich and uh, Madeline T Tobias called uh, Take Back Your Life. And yep. it talks about, yeah, it just gives like a bullet list of like all this kind of psychological effects you go through after leaving a cult. And my whole family left when uh, I was kind of a teenager, kind of towards the end of my teens. And it was kind of a slow drift away from it, you know, because you can't just like leave and be like, screw you guys, because that just causes so much problems. Like I recommend to anyone just like, you know, just walk away and, you know, touch base. It, it, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of strings attached. So, um, yeah, well, I read that book and, uh, it just, you know, it even gave, uh, advice to therapists on how to treat people who came out of cults. And I'm like, wow, this is really knowledgeable. So I was like, well, I, I need to find a therapist who, you know, specializes in this specific issue. So, um, luckily I'm in Northern California. So of course I did, because <laughs> this is where all the cults came from in the sixties and seventies. So, yes. um, you know, so the person who is my therapist, uh, she, she was also in a cult for a while and, you know, um, it's just, it's so just out of this world. It's, it's just, you can't know how, how crazy, like just how far removed from society and then how normalized that is. You can't like begin to understand that reality until you're pushed that far into it. And um, yeah, and so I get that. And uh, it makes it hard because your spectrum of like human understanding, it, it, it becomes so wide and just like the possibilities that it, are you familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yes, yes. Um, is that the effect where um, you think you're smarter than you actually are? Yeah, it's where, well, it's where, what, what my take was that, um, uh, I guess, it, or my understanding was that it's, it's where you, you understand the possibilities of a situation so much that you're discouraged from like pursuing something like, uh, so that's how I feel sometimes. It's, sometimes it's hard to, to feel hope when you just know that some people will just, will die with their false beliefs, you know, with their ridiculous beliefs and they'll die happy, you know, like there's no telling someone ultimately that they're right or wrong. There's no like um, happy ending. Like you have to just, you know, do your best. And j just like for me, knowing the extent of how far people will think, you know, how far down the rabbit hole they'll go or, you know, and at the same time, you can't call them crazy and they, they can just call you crazy back. Like whatever you say, you have to be ready to take the same thing back. So, because according to their perspective, so it's, so there's the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to kind of, it's kind of exhausting, but at the same time, it's, it's good to know that there's other people I, I talk with online about all this and just, you know, to me, that's my challenge is like, how can I communicate this to people who grew up like me or with the same beliefs? And, you know, in a way that's like, look, you're like, it's not you, it's not uh, your beliefs, it's that narcissism is like a very real thing and it has very real effects on people. And, um, you know, you're being led by this guy who has so much money and power and, and it's a very common thing. I mean, I, th I believe there are over 5,000 cults in America alone. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> it's, to me, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an abusive relationship, like on a wider scale. Like to me, that's what a cult is and abusive relationships are very common. So, you know, I wish that, um, and I feel like in our culture, like cults are becoming a more known thing and um, a more accepted thing, I mean, accepted in that, in the awareness of their existence. I mean, <laughs> but um, yeah, um, like what, what I didn't like before was that it was like a pop culture joke, you know, and like people were treated like, you know, 
to me, it's like, don't treat abuse, abuse people like they're crazy. If you are born into a cult, and of course you may not realize it's a cult until much later on, or even if you if you join one, it's going to be a slow process that they draw you in, and you might not be aware for the longest time. And you can be, you right. could be the most switched on, smartest person, and it could still draw you in, couldn't it? Right. Yeah. And I think that's another important thing that I I want to try and get out there more is that it's anyone is susceptible. Um, I mean, we talk about this all the time. Again, like me and my friends who grew up in the church and everything, like we have to try to figure out our parents so that we can save them from you know, just being homeless or just being left on the street to die, which some of them have, you know, what we seeing is believing and we have seen this before. And, you know, I'm, me and my siblings, we're all helping my parents, uh, you know, um, they, they, they know, they kind of understand what happened to them. Again, they left, but, you know, most people, they spend their whole careers putting away some money for retirement. And uh, in this country, it's not very forgiving in that department, unfortunately. So you're really left to fend for yourself. And um, luckily my parents had like five kids and we all can help them. But um, yeah, uh, it, it, anyone is susceptible. Um, you know, I think with enough social influence, we're, we're social beings and uh, you get, you take someone away to a retreat center where like everyone is about this, you know, and everyone around you for like a week is just even through subtle nuance ways, discouraging your own free thought anymore. And they're like, Hey, you got to follow this gra You follow this philosophy, follow this guy. Um, you know, th that's powerful. And you, you can't know what that's like until it happens to you. Um, but another thing is, uh, I think in the 60s and 70s, you know, it was a time of deconstruction, confusion, you know, JFK was assassinated, there was the war going on. So like, I think a lot of Americans were afraid and, you know, nuclear bomb, everything, um, and really didn't know who to confide in. And, uh, you know, from, from what I've studied, it's like, people were looking for a guru, like it was this thing that like people like did. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, maybe some people found some very positive experiences that way, but, you know, yeah. a lot of uh, narcissists make themselves out to be, you know, gurus of, uh, of one form or another. So, yeah. So uh, you mentioned the A&E TV series, which uh, you, you appear quite prominently in the Sanctuary Church episode. Um, in it, we see you confronting members of, of the group, of the uh, Sanctuary Church, and you're asking them about the wisdom of arming young children, which is, of course, something they yeah. do. So were you pleased with what the show covered, or do you have any misgivings about how the media in general perceives cults or society in general perceives cults? Uh, well, overall, I was pretty happy. Um, I think the edit was good. They put in a lot of key points that I wanted to, to, to have in there. Um, you know, basically, like, for example, even in the in the trailer, like one of the first things I say is like, this isn't a Christian group. And then they show pictures of them with guns. You know, I think when people think Christian, uh, well, that seems to be changing these days with uh, the political extremism. But, you know, I think people think, oh, a charitable group or like, you know, they practice kindness and like, you know, just accepting all people and, you know, that like Jesus was. But, um, you know, so uh, basically it's like, I don't know that... <laughs> like guns and bullet crowns were like part of the equation there. So um, again, like I, I want to speak to people of faith because they're speaking to people of faith and they're using that to like bring them in into this extremist group led by narcissists. So I'm glad they could show bits of my personal story, of course. Um, you know, uh, in it, I talked about how there was an accident involving a gun in my own family where my brother, because he was around the culture where guns were cool in the unification church, um, you know, he bought a gun himself. And then uh, we lived in a house in the woods and he accidentally shot my mom thinking that it was like a deer or something. So, um, you know, we've had to deal with that. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I'm glad they left that in. They showed a picture of my mom in a wheelchair. Uh, basically showing like, hey, you know, like this is, this isn't something to be taken lightly. And, um, you know, but Sanctuary Church has taken it to a whole new level where they're like, we got to use this, they're intertwining it with religious paranoia. And that's where it's scary. Yeah, you know, I, I think with any kind of documentary or series on cults, uh, there's, a, there's always like the smoke and mirrors. Like, you know, I know that, um, I think originally the production crew, like they didn't, 
they wanted to keep it more objective, but I think maybe the executives were like, well, we got to really sell this. So, you know, we got to, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, um, there was that. And, you know, I knew that the sanctuary church was going to, well, they would have reacted to it either way, but, um, you know, um, yeah, I, th yeah, I think that, yeah. John was really like, oh, wow, look, we're getting publicity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That, and they're it. like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I watched one reaction video from actually Gideon, the, the guy I spoke to uh, at the protest, and he was like, well, thanks for getting us exposure, you know. Um, but, you know, I think at the same time, uh, there was this one uh, one candidate for uh, senator, I think, a Republican candidate for senator. His name, I believe, his name is Scott Wagner, and mm -hmm. he he did endorse them before, and he was on their side before. But uh, they recently went to support him at one of his events, and he like rejected them. So I think maybe it did put the word out there that look, this is who these people really are. Maybe he did see it, and he saw that it, it's not wise to be associated with these people. Um, but you know, that said. Um, I know these people like these are my parent. These are my friends loved ones. Uh, some of them are my friends are freaking out that their parents are holding these guns and They're just so far down this rabbit hole because like, you know as second generation like we get to go to college and you know um, <clears throat> We basically we never chose this so, you know, we learn how to live in society We are young adults. We have more options in our careers and we learn that in order to survive, you can't keep giving your money away to this church and you can't just take their word for it. Like you, you know, we, to survive in society, you have to get along with society. You can't be this like, you know, extremist group. So uh, we know that, but our parents are so far in it because they joined it at, again, a different time. Um, maybe it made more sense to them then. So uh, yeah, so like I do, I do care about the people in it. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't know if there's more hope. Uh, there's a lot of hope for the older ones in the church because they've been, you know, just in that world for decades. And, uh, you know, what are they going to have if they come out of it? But for the kids who are just learning that they have to defend themselves with guns and weapons and, you know, to a ridiculous degree, like I asked them, like in the show, I was like, who's coming after you with guns? Like name one person who's coming after you and trying to attack you. Like, right? Like. What does the main church think of the sanctuary splinter group church? Um, I've seen a few of their like letters, like their public letters, and they, they think it's it's ridiculous. They're like, we're not for this like crazy gun, you know, cult. Yeah, and this is not us, that sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. And you know, that's kind of how those of us who've distanced ourselves from the church are looking at this. We're like, well, they're all rivaling each other and they're probably just going to take each other down. And, you know, we're all just kind of this, the, the descent is happening because, you know, Sun Young Moon is is gone and he's not holding it all together anymore. And now there are, there's all this infighting. So, you that know. That usually happens and there are splinter groups. And I, I take it there's more than one. Is that right? Yeah. So there, there's Sanctuary Church. There's also like a bunch of church members actually start their own groups. Um, I, I can't really name any off the top of my head, but then there's also uh, Hyun Jin, who uh, Preston Moon, who um, has this group called Global Peace Foundation, mm -hmm. and uh, Hyun Jin is I don't know. There was a video that you know he he protects his PR pretty strongly, but there was a video of him. Uh, um, you know, basically, he's like a mafia boss. Like, if some if anyone challenges him, if anyone does anything he disagrees with, he'll like hit them in public like in front of the whole congregation and like i remember i would go to these like speeches when i was a kid uh where yeah where they would basically it's like public shaming which is a very common thing in cults um you know if someone was not following orders they would just get hit or just yell that in front of everyone and the rest the rest of the room is just scared you know like oh my god what's he gonna do to him you know, but yet at the same time, it's like, well, this is our team. And so we have to stand by this. Um, you know, this is sometimes there's these hiccups, but ultimately this is for God. So it's OK. You know, even though I was never like beat up, um, my, my friends were I can name like five or six of them who were beat up by other, you know, Reverend Moon's children. Um, you know, even though I was never touched uh, in that way, um, just that that was permissible 
uh, through therapy, I'm realizing the damage that, that, that I have because of it. Um, just that, it, that I accepted this way of life and, um, which, you know, I'm trying to get that out there more. It's like, it's, I, it's still happening at least in Preston's, uh, division, I believe he's just doesn't have control. And like, you know, at the same time, it's like, if I grew up like them, I'd probably be the same way just having this dad who's like, oh, I'm this messiah and they have billions of dollars and businesses and full grown adults have been bowing to them since they were like toddlers. So sure. just say somebody comes across this interview, they watch this, they get this far and they're in Unification Church, but are thinking I, I, I really should get out or any cult. What advice would you give to them right now? Um, I would say look into the patterns like, you know, uh, you know, A and E isn't paying me for this or anything. But if you watch the final episode where I talk to someone from the FLDS and the Children of God, uh, we basically go through a bullet point list of, oh, the, my cult leader did this, mine did too, mine did too. In this way, like for example, like Warren Jeffs, uh, who is the prophet of the FLDS, which is like a Mormon extremist group. Um, you know, he lived a life of luxury and he, he had motorcycles, he would hang out with girls and everything. And like, I was like, oh, my version of that is uh, some young moon would go to Las Vegas and, you know, basically live this life of luxury. And, you know, there's basically just these checkpoints of these things in common. That's what, how it happened for me when I left the church. It was like what one of the first things that made me question it was that I was talking to someone who was Jewish. And, you know, I was like, well, in our church, we believe that we have the pure blood and you know, there's the fall of man and everything. And then she was like, oh, actually, well, we have that same belief. And I think the Muslims do too. And it's like, wait, what? Really? Like I was maybe like 17, 18. And that's and, really uh, therapeutic, isn't it? It really helps to break down the, the barriers on your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just to know that, Hey, you're not special. <laughs> like, And that's yeah. so freeing to know that you're not special. Cause then that weight, the weight of the world is off your shoulders. You could like, Oh, I can exist in this stuff that I see. Cool. Like, Oh, finally I can like walk into a store and not feel like I have to save everyone. You know, I mean, I see it as almost like an addiction and, you know, I would never say that outright to someone. Um, I'm only saying this at the end of this interview because of everything else I've said, but like, I don't want to be like, you're addicted, you know? Um, but you know, it, it's like you're, you're removed from reality. You're relying on something outside of yourself to fulfill you and to make you feel good. Um, it's kind of an escape and, uh, you know, it can be a, a collective thing with other people. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I do these days, I view cults as kind of like medication where maybe you need it at first, maybe you need some kind of support. I mean, I've heard stories of parents who like stop hitting their children after they joined like Jehovah's Witness or something like that, which is great. But then like, um, you know, eventually they just get sucked into it. And uh, there's also this issue of uh, a, a pattern that I've noticed in the Unification Church and the Sanctuary Church is um, like, for example, some parents, I've heard at least three or four stories where uh, a church member, someone who was about to join the church, be right before they met the church, they were going to commit suicide or they were in a life or death situation. And then someone from the church comes and saves them, you know, and then they devote the rest of their life to it. So it's almost like a life support, you know? Um, so that's what you're working with sometimes with people. And it's like, yeah. So in that way, it's like medication where um, you can get hooked on it, um, but then you kind of lose yourself in it. Or that's the possibility. So it's complex. It, it's really, you know, because like something is working there. Something is helping a person there. And so the question is like, what can we, what can society provide or how can we approach this in a way that's healthier, that's not led by a narcissist, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Teddy Host, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Talk Beliefs and hopefully we will catch up with you and get an update in uh, the very near future. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, just any opportunity to talk about this is great. So appreciate what you do. No problem. See you again soon. Thanks.